Tom Reddy from Talk Sport joins us. Tom, you're calling that game at Anfield. Liverpool just marching on after the Klopp announcement. They're looking pretty strong at the moment. Well, I'll tell you what, I think the Jurgen Klopp farewell tour is going to be very, very hard to stop. And the Arsenal game on Sunday at Emirates Stadium is going to be just a must-watch encounter for any football fan around the world. I mean, look, they have no, no Mo Salah at the moment. Uh, went off to AFCON, got injured. We're a couple of weeks away from, from seeing Mo Salah at least. It was such a cruise against this Chelsea team. Oh, look, they're a mid-table team. They might have cost a billion dollars, but they're a mid-table team. So it's a result you'd expect, but it's the way Liverpool always look like they're going to score goals. It's the, the almost the embarrassment of resource they've got. I mean, they've lost Trent Alexander-Arnold for a couple of weeks, right? He came back on tonight. He's been replaced by this uh, Northern Irish teenager, Connor Bradley, who was at Bolton last season, was, was voted their, their player of the year. Um, Academy product who went out there on loan. He was sensational. He was the best player on the pitch. He scored his first Liverpool goal, which had shades of Gerrard to it. Two assists in the game. The second one uh, across the Sabah slide to wrap it up the three was fantastic. You know, they can score goals for fun at Liverpool. They've got so many resources. They can even afford Darwin Nunez, the agent of chaos that is, to have 12 shots at goal. None of them go in and he missed a penalty and they still won by four. You know, it's they score goals, they defend well, they've got this clock factor, they've got the cop factor. It is all lined up for them to go on a bit of a march here. And the weird thing about it now as well, because Klopp has, has, has said he's going to go, is that there'll be more people willing them to win it now than maybe there was. It was not Man United, Everton or, you know, Arsenal or City fans, but your neutral football fan listening to this right now might be thinking, yeah, that's a good story now. I'd love to see Klopp go out with uh, with a bang with a title and if they play as good as they did tonight in games moving forward I think that will uh, will only gather steam that narrative Well Man City back Harlan makes uh, his appearance again after injury they're five points behind they've got a game in hand Arsenal are same points as Man City those three teams well is it just the two teams Tom I mean can we talk about Arsenal if Arsenal beat Liverpool on Monday yeah we can talk about them but I still think it's a two horse race is it? Um, I think you've got to wait till that game. I really do. I think if Arsenal were able to beat this Liverpool team with this momentum, then we have to talk about them as contenders. The issue with Arsenal continues to be, as we saw against Forest um, on Tuesday, that goals are going to be hard to come by. That isn't the case for City and Liverpool. And I do think they are third favourites in that group, but we'll have to see how the weekend goes. But in, in terms of City, I mean, I, I watched the first half of the game against Burnley. I didn't see the second, but... They just, they, they just have this total control of football matters at times. And a few years ago, I think Klopp was, uh, even Guardiola even was playing to, to entertain, to thrill, to give um, his critics, certainly after that first season where they won nothing and finished fourth and scraped into the Champions League. I think there was a couple of years where he was trying to thumb in the eye of those critics. Now I can play football and win. Now he's won everything there is to win. He's almost given up on entertaining people like me and you, the neutral. Uh, and he's just thinking about winning and winning and winning with a crushing inevitability. And that's why they're not winning 7-8-1 and eight one like they were in those old days. They got the second tonight. They scored a third. Burnley pulled one back. But when the second went in, the game was over. They shut it down. When City get the second you might as well start thinking about getting the bus home early to avoid the crowds. Um, and it's, they're just a machine, an unbelievable winning machine. And, you know, it's going to be interesting to see when we eventually find out about the charges hanging over Man City. But the embarrassment of riches they have to be able to bring on Kevin De Bruyne, Erling Haaland, these talents. A couple of weeks ago, it was Jeremy Doku off the bench. They have an extraordinary strength in depth. And they're going to be tough to beat. But as I've said to you every time we've spoken, the title race in this era will take over 90 points. It was a rarity at one point that would be required. Now it's a necessity. And I think we're going to get one, maybe two, possibly even three teams over 90, which would be amazing. 51 points, Liverpool after 22 games and City and Arsenal sitting there on 46 as I said and City got that game in hand. Is the top five the top five? Liverpool, City, Arsenal, Tottenham and Villa. There's an eight point gap now back to sixth place. Get that people, sixth place West Ham and you're talking about mid-table sides. Man United in ninth, Chelsea in tenth. I look at that pack of five. Hammers, Geordies, Brighton, who, lo who got, I want to talk about getting thumped by Luton, but Man United, Chelsea, maybe Wolves, because if Wolves actually win at Old Trafford tomorrow, but there is uh, seemingly a breakaway at the top. Is that right now? 
The only teams I think I would guarantee European football for are the teams that are currently in the top four, and I would guarantee the top three will qualify for the Champions League. Uh, the rest, I, I think, we'll need to see. I, I think there's still doubts about Tottenham, despite their uh, victory over Brentford uh, on Wednesday night. I, I think West Ham are still in that mix because despite being a bit ugly on the eye, they do, do get a lot of results. The game against Bournemouth for them on Thursday is going to be really interesting. Uh, 10 wins in 20 is nothing to be sniffed at for, for West Ham. And if you've got Mohamed Kadus, Lucas Paqueta, Calvin Phillips, James Ward-Prowse, um, you know, Jarrod Bowen, they've got a really good first team, West Ham, so they could cause a bit of damage. Villa, I, I think the loss against Newcastle on Tuesday was very damaging for them. I, I think they'll qualify for Europe, but I don't see a Champions League push in their future. Chelsea were awful in the game against Liverpool, and I'm reliably told by Chelsea fans they haven't played much better in recent times, but if Nkunku stays fit, he might score enough goals to get them top six, maybe top five. I, I don't have much faith in Manchester United. I don't have much faith in Newcastle United right now. But it's it's a wide open race for what's likely to be eight European spots. And I think only one of that top nine is going to miss out. If I were to pick one, I'd probably say Brighton. <laughs> Here's my analogy about West Ham, okay? So look, I'm, I'm just I'm just I'm just a normal London slapper. I've got a reasonable job and everything. And here's my boyfriend. He's called West London, Ham. What? He's a look, well, you know, you're saying West Ham, not easy on the eye, ugly on the eye. So I'm a girl, I've got a yes. boyfriend, his name is West Ham. Look, he's not the greatest looking guy, but he's got a good job. He owns his own house, he's not an a-hole. And so I'm kind of thinking, okay, he might be as good as I'm gonna get at the moment. Is that is that West Ham? Yeah. Are you saying West Ham fans are fantastic lovers? No, I'm just saying, saying that. I'm just saying that West Ham's that kind of boyfriend that you wish you had another one, but he'll do because he's not. You know, it's the best of a bad bunch. No, look, I think I think West Ham. They're a fascinating. They are genuinely fascinating, not just to me, but I think for for people listening to this who don't care about them as much as me as well. Because if you've got talent like Mohamed Kudus and Jared Bowen and Lucas Paqueta and, and Calvin Phillips and you know, Kurt Zuma and the goalkeeper Ariola. It is a really good first team. It's a terrific first 11 and 12 players. And I think if that team can stay fit, if, if David Moyes continues this incredibly effective way of playing football, forget the ball. It's almost an enemy. The ball is anathema to what David Moyes wants to do. If you continue to be as effective as they have been this season and they win another 9, 10, 11 games this campaign, putting them to to 20 plus wins if you win more than 20 games you're going to be in contention if you get above 60 points you will be in european contention or well, you will be in european football next year and if you get 68 you may well nick fourth and that race for fourth i don't think west ham are going to do that for the record but i do think as we speak today they're in that conversation let's look at the bottom then where yesterday luton producing a hell of a result against a brighton side which you know <laughs> you normally expect a bit better from them although they're only eight one eight games out of the 22 so far but luton with an adebayo hat trick they win four nil they climb out of the relegation zone everton below them uh, and of course everton have had their points confiscated and so forth but this is a luton town side that you know we've been talking all year about burnley sheffield luton they're all going straight up they're all going straight back down again can luton survive the amazing thing is, of that trio who I've always said they're going to go down, I actually thought Luton were the deadest of dead certs to go down. I thought Sheffield United or Burnley might do something. They've got worse and worse and worse, those two, as the season's gone on. Every point they've got feels stolen. But for Luton, it feels earned. Um, in Adebayo, they've got someone who can score goals. His second goal of his hat-trick against Brighton is a brilliant striker's goal. If Ian Wright had have scored that, it wouldn't have looked out of place. It was such a brilliant kind of give the keeper the eyes and put it in the other corner finish. The other ones are a great sniffer's goals. Ross Barkley has been one of the outstanding players in the Premier League this season. Kenilworth Road is the smallest pitch in the league, which means teams who go there to play expansive are unable to do so. And with the points deduction for Everton, with a potential one coming for Nottingham Forest too, um, I think they're going to make it. I really do. I think they can get, weirdly, I think they can get to 40. And if they get to 40, 37, with those other teams being uh, points deducted and the other two that came up with them going straight back down, I think they could do it. And I'll tell you what, they're winning a lot of hearts, Luton Town, because they are such underdogs with such a low budget. So to do what they are doing uh, is with this ragtag group of players you've either not heard of or you thought had retired by now, it's... It's a brilliant story. This is the that's the story you want to make a movie out of, um, and, and I think they might well do it. 
Another Rex and Netflix special, do you think? Tom, finally, it's just so good to talk to you. I just feel like this season has been the worst of the stop, start, start, stop, start, stop, start season. We've had international breaks. We've had that two-week winter break. Just, like, can we actually just get a run of fixtures going now? We're finally there after this ridiculous stuttering season. The winter break didn't work. It, it, it just didn't work. Um, and the annoying thing about the winter break is that next year, I don't think calendar-wise, they're going to be able to do it. Um, I love it conceptually, but what you've got to do is give everybody 10 days off. The way it was kind of split into two, um, I thought was a bit of a farce, frankly. And the fact that half the teams that plan to go to Dubai or Tenerife or whatever couldn't do so because they had an FA Cup replay all of a sudden because they couldn't win their third round tie. It was all a mess. I, I am pro winter break and I'd quite like to see it in the first week of January to recharge batteries, but also keep giving us the Christmas period, which I, I, I do enjoy. But there are obvious ramifications to playing that many games over December. But, but yeah, look, that's all over now. We don't have a, another break until March. Uh, when the next and final international break is. The FA Cup from fifth and sixth round has been moved to midweek, so we're not going to lose another weekend. So right now we board this mayhem train all the way to the back end of May, and we're in. Transfer window closes tomorrow. No more nonsense to talk about after that. And all there is is your players, your coach, and your future of four months of 20-plus of games. So we're there, finally, at last.